According to the Geological Society of America, sea levels at the start of the early Jurassic period were roughly the same as today, or even a bit lower. Over that 55 million year period, these levels fluctuated quite a bit, but showed a steady upward trend. At one point in the early Jurassic, the ocean was 75 meters, or 246 feet, higher than at any point in our time. Imagine how different the world would look under these conditions. All our coastal cities would be gone, as would much of the visible terrain. Our continent would appear smaller, and many islands and peninsulas would disappear altogether. A 25-story hotel on the beach in Miami would appear as nothing more than a rectangular island, no longer anywhere near visible land, but several hundred miles offshore, assuming that anything still showed above the waves. By the end of the Jurassic period, the ocean had risen 110 meters, or 360 feet higher than it is today. That means that what we now know as the Indian Ocean, the Philippine Sea, and the Arabian Sea were all combined in one continuous ocean which scientists today refer to as the Tethys. Likewise, North America and Eurasia were combined in a single supercontinent called Laurasia, but much of that was submerged, so it would have looked more like a few clusters of islands of various sizes with small seas between them that, like the Tethys, don't exist anymore. Europe had no connection to the Atlantic yet either. The Atlantic hadn't spread out much by then, was only a small sea itself, still mostly surrounded by Africa and the Americas. And when the waters rose to their highest point, North America was divided in half by the Western Interior Seaway, such that the entirety of Texas, Wyoming, Colorado, and the Dakotas, as well as significant portions of several other states, were all underwater that in some places were hundreds of feet deep. You might think that only half of Colorado would be submerged because the Rocky Mountains should have been a rocky shore on one side of the seaway, but the Rocky Mountains didn't exist yet. The western half of North America, which was then the westernmost part of the supercontinent of Laurasia, was growing by accretion, with a subduction zone building up the west coast by pushing belts of island arc terrains into the continental landmass. Then the zone changed positions, and the sudden shift in direction caused an orogeny, which is a sort of buckling of the continental plate that results in the creation of a mountain range over several million years. This is when the Sierra Nevada and the Klamath mountain ranges began to form. And remember that the Jurassic and Cretaceous periods were evidently a uniformly subtropical environment from the Arctic Circle to the Antarctic Circle. The global average temperature was a bit warmer than it is today, with no evidence of glaciation from that time. Indications are that neither pole was permanently frozen. There were dinosaurs living in Antarctica who could migrate to Africa, Australia, or South America in the winter months because they were all still connected at that time as the supercontinent of Gondwana land. The point is that Antarctica wasn't buried under a mile of permafrost like it is today, and neither was Greenland. With both poles completely melted, that raised the water level so high that even though the Jurassic had two supercontinental shelves, Laurasia and Gondwana, what showed above water looked more like a thousand semi-tropical islands over half the world. This seems like an ideal environment for sailors. I mean, it would be a dream to live on a schooner in a world like this, hopping from island to island, right? Except, of course, that the Mesozoic seas were full of things that we're not used to. There were ammonites at that time that were big enough to fuel nightmares, and they were just the beginning. If you're a fisherman, there were Jurassic fish, I mean, just regular bony fish that were 50 feet long. You're going to need a bigger boat. If you lived on a sailboat hopping between tropical islands, sharks would be the least of your worries. This was a time when sharks could not compete against the reptiles. Every geologic period had sea monsters lurking in the depths, and none more impressive than in the Mesozoic era. The fanciful exaggerations that medieval map makers embellished out of what we know to be just harmless whales is pretty much the actual image you would have seen through your camera if you were a time traveler focusing on ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs, and eventually mosasaurs, among even more terrifying leviathans of that era. These veritable sea monsters were the first paleo species ever identified as such, and this led to a disorienting revelation. People used to believe silly things about fossils, I mean, if they know about them at all. They thought they were either creatures turned to stone by the gaze of a gorgon, or perhaps they were God's practice doodles, things God sculpted out of the dust of the earth but that he never bothered to bring to life. And whatever we used to think about fossils, in the 1700s we finally realized that fossils were the lithified casts of once living bones and such, so expeditions were organized to dig up more. Lots and lots more. Enough to come to the uncomfortable realization that there was another, far more ancient world before and beneath the world of men. 
Just as dinosaurs on land had gotten huge and diverse, so had the reptiles of the sea. These were not dinosaurs, nor even archosaurs. These things were more closely related to lizards than to dinosaurs. And mosasaurs actually were lizards. The closest living thing to them alive today are the giant monitor lizards of Indonesia, except that mosasaurs were the biggest lizards ever, being as long as typical whales. But mosasaurs didn't come along until the Cretaceous period, and we're still talking about the Jurassic. Ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs got their start from similar looking animals way back in the Triassic, the biggest difference between them being behavior. The ancestors of plesiosaurs evidently didn't use their tails for swimming, where ichthyosaurs obviously always did. And the change this had on their morphology was stark. As you can see, over many generations, the tailbone bent down and a ridge along the back of the tail became the opposing fluke. And the same thing happened with an ocean-going crocodile that lived at that time, as well as some of the later mosasaurs of the Cretaceous period. The ichthyosaur lineage began with Carterhynchus here, a tiny reptile which could have moved around on the beach like a seal. And later, ichthyosaurs had to give birth live because they had to live in the water forever, just like dolphins. Anyone asking for a transitional species could start with Carterhynchus here and then move down this collection of fossil finds. This is the sequence of intermediates you asked to see. And they range in size from about as big as a person to as big as a whale, like pretty much everything else in the ocean at that time. At the turn of the 19th century, when many of these fossils were discovered, people still thought that whales and dolphins were breathing fish, not understanding why a creator would make a fish out of a mammal. Then suddenly they had to explain how there were also fossils that looked like dolphins, but made out of reptiles. Back before Darwin explained evolution, this must have been a confusing thing for anyone to understand. So where were our ancestors in the mid-Jurassic? High on dry land, obviously and squirreled away in the nooks and crannies beneath the rocks and logs and down in our burrows and so forth. We talked in our last video about our placement in Trechnotheria, and now we're going to look at each of the subsets of that clade, starting with Amphitherium. This is one of the first Mesozoic mammals paleontologists ever discovered. And like most other mammals of that time, it looks a bit like a shrew that is known primarily from a bit of jawbone and teeth. Likewise, the sister clade of Symmetrodonts are another entirely extinct mammal group defined by their teeth. And they're called Symmetrodonts because their molars were, you know, symmetrical. And they're also distinguished from their sister clade, Cladotheria, by the shape of the auditory canal. Symmetrodonts, like everything else we've seen that has ears so far, had pretty much just a hole straight through the side of the head. But Cladotherians added a twist, literally. Where some prior mammals had a bit of a curve in the cochlear canal, Cladotherians had an extreme curve of 270 degrees, beginning a coil. Along with that came improvements in the laminae, nerve fibers, and other features to improve our hearing. All modern mammals, except for monotremes, have an inner ear canal that is coiled around like a brass wind instrument for the benefit of the obvious advantage to our hearing. So if the sound of that resonates with you, do you accept that it classes you in the clade of cladotheres?